I, I beg your pardon, he said hurriedly. I mean, this matter may be arranged uh, amicably. My interest with, and as you wisely say, my uh, knowledge of my client, uh, Mr. Hotchkiss, may affect a compromise. And damages, said the young girl, readdressing her parasol as if she had never looked up. The colonel winced. And uh, uh, undoubtedly compensation, if you do not press a fulfillment of the promise. Unless, he said with an attempted return to his former easy gallantry, which, however, the recollection of her eyes made difficult. It is a question of uh, the affections. Which, said his fair client softly. If you still love him, explained the colonel, actually blushing. Zaidi again looked up, again taking the colonel's breath away with eyes that expressed not only the fullest perception of what she had said, but of what he thought and had not said, and with an added subtle suggestion of what he might have thought. That's telling, she said, dropping her long lashes again. The colonel laughed vacantly. Then, feeling himself growing imbecile, he forced an equally weak gravity. Pardon me, I do understand there are no letters— May I know the way in which he formulated his declaration and promises? Hymn books, said the girl briefly. I beg your pardon, said the mystified lawyer. Hymn books, marked with words in them with pencil, and passed them on to me, repeated Zaidi. Like love, dear, precious, sweet, and blessed, she added, accenting each word with a push of her parasol on the carpet. Sometimes a whole line out of Tate and Brady. And Solomon's song, you know, and such. I believe, said the colonel loftily, that the uh, phrases of sacred psalmody lend themselves to the language of the affections. But in regard to the distinct promise of marriage, was there uh, no other expression? Marriage service in the prayer book, lines and words out of that, all marked, said Zaidi. The colonel nodded naturally and approvingly. Very good. Very good. Were others cognizant of this? Were there any witnesses? Of course not, said the girl. Only me and him. It was generally a church time or prayer meeting. Once in passing the plate, he slipped one of them peppermint lozenges with the letter stamped on it, I love you, for me to take. The colonel coughed slightly. <clears throat> and you have the lozenge? I ate it, said the girl simply. Ah said the colonel. After a pause, he added delicately, but were these attentions um, confined to uh, sacred precincts? Did he meet you elsewhere? Used to pass our house on the road, returned the girl, dropping to her monotonous recital, and used to signal. Ah, signal, repeated the colonel approvingly. Yes. He'd say Caro and I'd say Kari. Something like a bird, you know. Indeed, as she lifted her voice in the imitation of the call, the colonel thought it certainly very sweet and bird-like, at least as she gave it. With his remembrance of the grim deacon, he had doubts as to the melodiousness of his utterance. He gravely made her repeat it. And after that signal, he added suggestively. He'd pass on, said the girl. The colonel coughed slightly and tapped his desk with his penholder. Were there any endearments, uh, caresses, uh, such as taking your hand, uh, clasping your waist? He suggested, with a gallant yet respectful sweep of his white hand and bowing of his head. A slight pressure of your fingers and the changes of a dance? I mean, he corrected himself with an apologetic cough. <laughs> In the passing of the plate. No, he was not what you'd call fawn, returned the girl. Ah, uh, Donoram K. Hotchkiss was not fond in the ordinary acceptance of the word, said the colonel with professional gravity. She lifted her disturbing eyes and again absorbed his in her own. She also said, yes, although her eyes and their mysterious prescience of all he was thinking disclaimed the necessity of any answer at all. He smiled vacantly. There is a long pause, on which she slowly disengaged her parasol from the carpet and stood up. I reckon that's about all, she said. 
yes, but one moment, said the colonel vaguely. He would have liked to keep her longer, but with her strange premonition of him he felt powerless to detain her, or explain his reason for doing so. He instinctively knew she had told him all. His professional judgment told him that a more hopeless case had never come to his knowledge. Yet he was not daunted, only embarrassed. No, no matter, he said vaguely. Of course, I shall have to consult with you again. Her eyes again answered that she expected he would, but she added simply, When? In the course of a day or two, said the colonel quickly. I will send you word. She turned to go. In his eagerness to open the door for her, he upset his chair, and with some confusion that was actually youthful, he almost impeded her movements in the hall, and knocked his broad-brimmed Panama hat from his bowing hand in a final gallant sweep. Yet, as her small, trim, youthful figure, with its simple leghorn straw hat confined by a blue bow under her round chin, passed away before him, she looked more like a child than ever. The colonel spent that afternoon in making diplomatic inquiries. He found his youthful client was a daughter of a widow who had a small ranch on the crossroads near the new Firewell Baptist Church, the evident theater of this pastoral. They led a secluded life, the girl being little known in the town, and her beauty and fascination apparently not yet being a recognized fact. The colonel felt a pleasurable relief at this, and a general satisfaction that he could not account for. His few inquiries concerning Mr. Hotchkiss only confirmed his own impressions of the alleged lover. A serious-minded, practically abstracted man, abstentive of youthful society, and the last man apparently capable of levity of the affections or serious flirtation. The colonel was mystified, but determined of purpose, whatever that purpose might have been. The next day he was at his office at the same hour. He was alone, as usual, the colonel's office really being his private lodgings, disposed in connecting rooms, a single apartment reserved for consultation. He had no clerk, his papers and briefs being taken by his faithful body servant and ex-slave Jim to another firm who did his office work since the death of Major Stryker, the colonel's only law partner, who fell in a duel some years previous. With a fine constancy, the colonel still retained his partner's name on the door plate, and, it was alleged by the superstitious, kept a certain invincibility all through, through the manes of that lamented and somewhat feared man. The colonel consulted his watch, whose heavy gold case still showed the marks of a providential interference with a bullet destined for its owner, and replaced it with some difficulty and shortness of breath in his fob. At the same moment he had a step in the passage, and the door opened to Adoniram K. Hotchkiss. The colonel was impressed. He had a duelist respect for punctuality. The man entered with a nod and the expectant, inquiring look of a busy man. As his feet crossed that sacred threshold, the colonel became all courtesy, he placed a chair for his visitor and took his hat from his half-reluctant head. He then opened a cupboard and brought out a bottle of whiskey and two glasses. Uh, a slight refreshment, Mr. Hotchkiss, he suggested politely. I never drink, replied Hotchkiss with a severe attitude of a total abstainer. Uh, not the finest bourbon whiskey selected by a Kentucky friend? No? Well, then pardon me, a cigar then, the mildest Havana. I do not use tobacco nor alcohol in any form, repeated Hotchkiss aesthetically. I have no foolish weaknesses. The colonel's moist, beady eyes swept silently over his client's sallow face. He leaned back comfortably in his chair and, half closing his eyes as in dreamy reminiscence, said slowly, Your reply, Mr. Hotchkiss, reminds me of a singular circumstances that uh, occurred in point of fact at the St. Charles Hotel, New Orleans. Pinky Hornblower, personal friend, invited Senator Doolittle to join him in social glass. Receive, singularly enough, reply similar to yours. Don't drink nor smoke, said Pinky. Gad, sir, you must be mighty sweet on the ladies. Ha! <laughs> the colonel paused long enough to allow the faint flush to pass from Hotchkiss's cheek, and went on, half closing his eyes. I allow no man, sir, to discuss my personal habits, said Doolittle over his shirt collar. Then I reckon shootin' must be one of those habits, said Pinky coolly. Both men drove out on the Shell Road back a cemetery next morning. Pinky put bullet at twelve paces through Doolittle's temple. Poor Doo never spoke again. Left three wives and seven children, they say. Two of them black. I got a note from you this morning, said Hotchkiss with badly concealed impatience. I suppose in reference to our case. 
You have taken a judgment, I believe. The colonel, without replying, slowly filled a glass of whiskey and water. For a moment he held it dreamily before him, as if engaged in gentle reminiscences called up by the act. Then, tossing it off, he wiped his lips with a large white handkerchief, and leaning back comfortably in his chair said, with a wave of his hand, The interview I requested, Mr. Hotchkiss, concerned a subject which I may say is, uh, at present not of a public or business nature, although later it might become, uh, both. It is affair of some delicacy.'